Welcome back to Seeker Strength and welcome back to Seeker Stan in our new fresh workwear because there I really wanted some polo shirts. Today's new show is brought to you by Seeker Strength app on iOS and Android. Now, a couple of people have been asking frequently, when will the Republic of Seeker Stan t-shirts be reprinted? And the reprint will be happening sometime in the next two months. Now, app users will get early availability and they will get a little discount for being an app user as well. So... Keep an eye on that if you're an app user, probably within the next two months or so. And then the merchandise, of course, will disappear again off the website, not to be seen possibly for another year. There will, of course, be limited availability. Republic of Seek Stan, classic design, because so many people wanted that. And there's a new design coming as well, which I really like. First up, we've got Lasha, posted, of course, by Dr. Georgie, one of the strongest weightlifting physios. And Lasha's doing some 140 kilo muscle snatches. 200 kilo no foot snatch balances and some 285 kilo back squats. I feel like this is always how we see him start his training blocks off or this is always what the initial phase of training looks like. It tends to be the only time we really see any video of back squats coming up and we tend to see a fair uh, kind of emphasis being put on snatch balances or we'll see them for a number of weeks at the start of his training block. As you rightly pointed out Owen, he was in pretty good shape before Thailand. So it's not like he's starting from zero. Only three months to go. There's not a huge amount of time. So he's definitely not kind of doing a full prep phase all over again. But certainly there is a bit of room there in terms of snatch balance. And in terms of that muscle snatch, obviously, we'll see those weights climbing up over the next couple of months, hopefully. So he, we saw like 208 and 240 something. So I don't think they've really hidden anything else from from us in this prep leading up to Thailand, for example. He was in the training hall. He didn't lift. He does look to be in a lot of pain. I think most people are understanding that he's probably quite sore. It's been a quite a long and illustrious career. And I'm not... I think he'll still pull out the win in Paris, but it's probably not going to be as easy for him as it might have been when he was in his absolute best ever shape. Uh, it, you know, If Lallian comes in in good shape, if Gore comes in in good shape, maybe Edward Zia Zaluni maybe Manasad. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of contenders there who could put it up to him because if he's really hurt and he's got a lot of different things building up, which he's had those for years, uh, Anton used to train with him, Anton Plesnoy, and he told me Lasha was always sore, but he always put up those big numbers. But it seems like now they're kind of coming together a little bit too much. So I'm sure he'll put out a big snatch, but pulling out a big clean and jerk at those numbers when you're pretty sore might be tough. So... I'm rooting for Lasha, of course, but it might be a tough battle, which will be better for the viewers, of course. Yeah. But for Lasha stands, it might it might be uncomfortable to watch. It might be tense. Just one thing on the the kind of duration of the career and, and people's careers being lengthened now. Obviously, Lasha isn't terribly old as an athlete, and I've seen some people make certain uh, kind of comparisons between how well Lou lifted into his mid to late 30s and why we wouldn't see something like that from Lasha. The absolute body weight makes a massive difference to athletes and just the weights they're lifting, like the weights have so much more of an effect and holding on to that body weight has so much more of an effect than it will for somebody who's late 70s, mid 80 kilos in the, in terms of their body weight. That just has a massive influence on your health span, but also in terms of being able to do multiple blocks in a row of training, um, you just can't get away from absolute weight. Yeah, like the if you think about the absolute back squat, he needs to maintain his numbers compared to what Lou Zhaojun would have needed. So Lou didn't seem to go past two seventy for a heavy single when he was snatching kind of the one late one sixties, one seventy when he was in the latter end of his career. Whereas Lasha probably needs to be maintaining something like three twenty, maybe a little bit more realistically. And he's quite an efficient lifter. And you know we never saw those squats being an issue for him before. But those big weights, just harder on the joints, tendons, it's harder on to keep that body weight high. You know, a lot of supers talk about that's actually quite difficult to maintain that body weight because you're quite active. It's quite niche sports where you're doing this much physical activity, but trying to maintain that much body weight and body fat percentage is quite interesting. You know, no one else would be training this much and having to eat this much food. So it is, there's a lot of things coming together that makes being a super at the top level hard. Now we do see a lot of older supers. If you looked at like the Europeans last year, most of the group was actually in their 30s, but they're not lifting those same weights. You know, They're still lifting very, very impressive weights, but for looking for peak big time daddy weights, 
Now, speaking of peaks time, Big Daddy Waits, we're in the section of the new show, formerly known as the Archer Manager Prof, then it moved to the Lee Sang. Lee Sang is a little hiatus from us at the moment. And Archer was back posting stuff from different points in his career. So it's now it's back to the Archer Manager Prof section of the new show. And he put up f- this 310 kilo back squat. So not really sure when they are from probably sometime last year. And he also put up 170 kilo snatch. This kind of makes me sad, Owen, because I want the Archer Manager Prof section to be back. And I want them to be contemporary videos. Well, I want nothing more than to see that man absolutely crucifying heavy jerks. Uh, this squat's absolutely lovely. 310 kilos, like it ain't nothing. Actually, speaking of those big jerks, he actually up this 230 after the last new show. He just made me think of it right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly what we want. Hopefully things will change and hopefully we'll see him back training very consistently in the next squad but who knows so here's the 170 kilo snatch i'm not sure how long the ban is for hopefully not too long but his snatch technique was always quite good really powerful it was just always seemed to be that bottom position that seemed to let him down Mm. uh, in terms of the snatching Uh, maybe even the overhead position was quite strange but when he makes snatches he's making them you know so it's you know he's quite a young lifter so he might have developed more into that class with the snatching so it remains to be seen still a bookmark in his career currently so who knows what's going to happen one thing i always felt watching a snatch was as he's standing up the bear is so close to his head yeah it is like he's that super wide grip which obviously works due to torso length in relation to arm length Uh, but when he goes to stand up it looks like you could barely fit your hand in between his his head and the barbell you know now speaking of Another lifter, Archim Okulov, another Archim, I didn't even mean to put them together, <laughs> who is also on a little hiatus. Now, I don't think Archim ever actually tested positive. I think he just got caught up in the the sweeping ban of Russia. But as we guessed a few weeks ago, we figured whoever is kind of the bigger lifters currently on the Russian team are probably planning to put up some big numbers around the time of the Olympics just to make a statement, and Archie put up this 200 kilo clean front squat and jerk. He would have almost certainly been an 89 kilo lifter and very, very likely would have been an incredibly competitive 89 kilo lifter had he been given the chance. So this 200 kilo clean front squat and jerk is a very significant number. You know, it's it's quite interesting. You have to hand it to the Russians. They have an ability to develop jerkers like nobody else. Yeah. Like, obviously, there's a number of noteworthy countries who are kind of getting over their issue with not being able to develop the split jerk well or any kind of athlete to jerk well. They've massively gotten over those issues. But Russia have consistently, year on year, generation on generation, made fantastic split jerkers. And Akilov is no exception to that. Yeah, you often think about, think about talk about the pull, and we're guilty of this as anyone where we're talking about the pull technique and this kind of the particular finesse people might pull on it maybe if you're belarus and belarusian you're going knees out or chinese you're probably uh, a little bit lower hip start position but we never really think about the actual specifics of the flares on jerk technique and you can quite tell i think jerks from russia are some of the best in terms of timing lockout overhead position all all comes together really well so it'd be interesting to see what numbers they put up uh they have Quite a big U team at the moment. Don't know if there's anyone pretty special on that. You know, we have people like Archim still lifting, uh, Timur Nanev is still lifting, a couple of other lifters who are from the 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 big teams from before the A team kind of. So it'll be interesting to see if Archim puts up any big lifts. He also had a 160 kilo snatch hang snatch, which I didn't get a video of, so it was in his story, and it looked very very good. So be interesting to see. I'll, I'll certainly mm. be, we'll certainly be watching those numbers. Now here's an Uzbek lifter. Abdushkurov, catty boy, cat nailed Kate, it. Kate boy, he. What I really like about this is 170 kilo clean front squat complex again. But what I really like about this is the actual clean. So one of the biggest things we have an issue with in the clean is specifically when it comes to amateur and intermediate lifters, and sometimes even better lifters is a really big habit of over pulling the clean and it's always great to have examples where you can really see someone pulling under aggressively and minimizing the amount of extension and time and extension and just really focusing on pulling under and at the same time pulling the barbell up so it's a very very hard concept to get used to in heavy cleans because you need practice those heavy cleans and you also need to know the right thing to focus on and he does an exceptional job of essentially sneaking under the barbell yeah i think the second thing kind of leading on from that 
When you look at the clean front squat jerk complex, a really common error, or it's not necessarily an error, but kind of quirk people will lean into is they'll do their clean, they'll catch it with that same tempo they'll always catch their cleans with. And then when they go to front squat it, they'll have an incredibly different tempo. So they'll get through the clean and then that kind of timing or that practice of the timing and the squat will be completely different. It'll be very, very slow in the eccentric. Maybe they won't quite use the bounce or maybe they'll have slightly different knee tracking. If you take this athlete's uh, tempo and their movement patterns through that clean catch position and the front squat catch position, they're absolutely identical. And it's something that's quite rare to see. You'll see a nice dynamic use of good timing and that clean catch but the exact same movement pattern in the front squat which I really like athletes to have I think it really does feed into their technique quite well and when we're using a complex like this sometimes we're using it just to make it a bit more difficult sometimes we're using it to auto regulate the load but mostly we're using it to define and to really practice a certain movement pattern and this kind of replication of catch patterns with the squat is very very useful for that now here we've got Brian Ibanez, who is 17 years old, and they're saying he weighs 79 kilos, and he squatted this back squat PR of 280 kilos. What in God's name is going on, Owen? Insane lifting. It's crazy lifting. This is so, so good. Obviously, we've seen a lot of Brian's lifting over the last number of months, or a couple of years, really, in this case. 280 kilos is an absolutely huge hallmark for somebody who's less than 80 kilo body weight. What's that, 3.2 times body weight? Three no three point eight times body weight. Three so half would be forty kilos onto that. So be so yeah, so it's two and a half. Three, three and, and a half, half, sorry. Three and a half times body weight. It's unbelievably impressive. Always with that kind of same steadfast torso angle. We never see him deviating forward with his torso. Uh, it's the same kind of pattern at all the heavy weights we see a squat looking identical to this. So very, very nice squats. It really does put that that kind of rate limiting factor on his snatch and clean and jerk that one step higher again. Yeah, and it's it's definitely something you want to be developing if you're looking for a bigger career. The stronger you are earlier, in some ways, the better it is because the more you can make use of that strength for your snatch and clean and jerk and you don't have to be worrying about that later in your career. And the longer your body gets used to that high force production and that strong weight the longer and the better you've an opportunity to be a better athlete for a more powerful athlete for longer into your career so if you can for a lot of a lot of your career if you can do this as a younger athlete you can kind of do more at the same time in some certain circumstances like you might be able to peak quite as well as younger athletes but you can do a lot more together like you can push the volume a little bit harder you can push those weights a little bit faster than you might otherwise and you can kind of get a lot more things done for those couple of years when the weights are normally when they're a little bit lower than this but in his case it's relative to himself normally these athletes were seeing lighter weights and the progression at the teenage years doesn't always give you a good indicator of what's definitely going to happen in the later years but it is a good place to set yourself up so that rate of progression doesn't always continue but the younger you can do it if you're aiming for that top level of weightlifting the better it is the better an opportunity you're giving yourself now, speaking of someone who's only two years older, <laughs> is Carlos Nazar. So, obviously, we saw him miss those 224 kilo jerks in Thailand for the world record attempt. So, here we've got him attempting 210 kilos for a one plus two, but he misses that second jerk. Yeah, and the first jerk is very textbook in terms of Carlos's technique. He always has those same kind of quirks or those same kind of deficits in his jerk technique. I do think it really does highlight, though, how difficult it makes it when you have those quirks in your jerk like he has to work so so hard on keeping that bar overhead with that kind of non-ideal recovery pattern that he has um, and it really does when you see the second jerk here it really does kind of highlight some of those errors obviously we do things like this in training our coaches do things like this in training to try and highlight some errors or kind of really put certain things on the table in terms of these are this is where you need to be fast this is what you really need to focus on but in this case i think it just highlights him to the point where it's virtually impossible that he's going to make that second jerk so in this case if you were to try fix an issue like this one plus two can be a useful strategy usually we do that one plus two for a bit more volume sometimes that heavy single is useful but this is the case where if you're trying to really correct technical errors especially in the jerk 
this is where some variation comes in but mostly just a little bit more volume in the jerk trying to fix the things you want to fix so rack jerks maybe behind your neck jerks and maybe some different positions maybe a little pause jerk depending on what's trying to fix but going for super heavy and i'm not saying this is the only thing carlos is doing in his training with his coach but just if we're taking this for an example and take it out of context if you don't know but if this was your particular position and you always miss your heavy jerks fixing them by just doing a heavy one plus two isn't the only answer it could be part of the equation but a lot of times you might be looking at behind the neck jerks for a lot of volume we're talking four to five sets of three and not really dropping below that four or five sets of three for weeks on end and we might even never go for that heavy single because the jerk from the front might improve which typically does a lot of times we'll have a lifter struggling with the jerk from the front and we'll do a lot of front squats we'll try and improve the front squat. In Carlos case, it's not really power available to him. It's particular positions. So then we're looking at more volume from the jerk. So we might do jerk from the block or jerk from the black. And we're still looking at a pretty high volume in that, or high for weight of things. So sets of three, we might go to sets of two. Then we might do some heavy singles, but the heavy single isn't necessary to fix the position. It's the volume that will fix the positions here on those heavy jerks rather than the uh, the f- heavy singles because you get so little practice because it's not power and strength that's the issue for Carlos. It's the actual positions that are the issue on the jerk. So the more you practice at that kind of 70, 90%, the better it is for the weightlifting. Plenty of power and strength there. Plenty of power and strength. Very power. Next, we've got Abigail Cooper. So I'm actually not sure what weight Abigail is, but she snatched 98 kilos and clean jerked 116 kilo with a squat jerk. Yeah, there's the big kind of defining lift uh, or the defining factor of her lift here and it goes across both the snatch and the squat jerk is just how good she maintains that vertical torso angle. Everybody wants a squat jerk. It looks class. Loads of people try it, particularly if there's a certain level of amateur stroke early intermediate lifter who thinks that they're going to get a better jerk from doing the squat jerk. Obviously, Abigail isn't in that category, but almost nobody's able to maintain that torso angle as well as she is here. So when you see her catching the snatch, very, very well-maintained torso angle. But particularly when we see that overhead squat position on the squat jerk, that torso angle is absolutely perfect. So we don't see the bear being pushed way, way back behind. We don't see her throwing her head and her chest forward. We don't see that kind of forward torso lean. It's a very, very nice shallow angle of torso lean which leads to this incredibly well stacked position so if we were to look at that directly from the side we'd see wrist directly above elbow elbow directly above shoulder shoulder directly above slightly in advance of the hips and we don't have this kind of rearward pushing it's that straight up and down stacking which just leads to these very very good positions that bottom position in the snatch is the bottom position that every 45 year old who started weightlifting three years ago dreams of <laughs> i know it's true i know you're i know you're out there you can have it if you work in your mobility and i know time. you're watching you can have that if you just put a bit of work in now here we've got alexi lovchev one of those kind of russian a team i was talking about he recently had a very interesting video up with misha or mikhail kokleev and we might actually do a longer reaction to that because it was nearly an hour but there were some interesting lifts in it but Recently in training, he did this 320 kilo pause back squat. Now, this is almost certainly recent given the shape he's in in that video. And Lovechev was obviously one of those people who would have been performing in Paris in that A group or in the only group for the super heavies. But I'm struggling to think of a heavier full range of motion pause squat than this. I can't think. Have we seen anyone? So forget about powerlifters doing, you know, which it's impressive not to talk. It's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. different thing. This particular like high bar. I actually don't. Olympic squat. Olympic squat. I can't think of any. It's, I I have to say something about Love Jeff. Don't. I feel like he's been at this same age and at this same level of performance for the last 12 years, which by no means is a dig or a slight or anything. It is incredibly impressive how strong he has stayed for the last 10 years. It well, makes no sense. But that's what I wanted to talk about in the video. So in that video, Misha squats 290 kilos and he's 45 and he's retired. Like high bar squats 290 or 280 pretty casually to be fair. <laughs> and Misha uh, Lovchev, Lovchev does like a 300 kilo squat but it's like piss easy. Yeah. Like in terms of who I always thought had a great opportunity of putting a lot of work on, and I've said this before on Lasha, was Lovchev. Like, we saw him clean jerk the world record, 
tested positive for Iparmarillin after. And so they took the world record from him. He did that 264. It was a very good snatch. And I think if we'd seen the advent of Peak Lasha and we hadn't seen Lovchev get knocked off the pedestal, yeah. I think we would have seen him snatch probably 215 or 217 or more and go for a big clean and jerk, you know. It uh, could have been, never was, though, unfortunately. Yeah. But we always forget, like, Lovchev is a freak. Like, he's always doing massive deadlifts with these. He's doing these big squats. He reminds me of a man of sad with those lifts, you know. Yeah. And 320. I can't think... And it's a crazy pause as well. It's not like... That's a fully legitimate pause. It's yeah. not a stop squat or any of those things. That's He's fully paused in the bottom. Brodrick Javis had on his Instagram the other day. The, so, or he's talking a story. He's in Juju Mufu's gym. And they're like, the only place the pause is in the Instagram caption. Written. <laughs> That's the only place it is. Whereas when Love Jeff's pausing here, it's like, oh. Yeah, it's clear to everybody. No, I love it. Nobody's come harder and come for a longer time. Well, unfortunately, he didn't get a chance. To, I won't finish the sentence. Oh, my God. Now speaking <laughs> of the Russian team. I <laughs> oh, oh wow. Well. There it is. Hey, we get taken down off YouTube finishing that sentence. Next up, we got Vasily. Vasily. So Vasily, obviously a, a freak of nature, put up this 170 kilo pause, not pause, 170 kilo deficit power snatch. It goes 150, 160, 170. Vasily's just one of my favorite scarf. Yeah. Remember he used to call himself the bull for a while? Or he was calling it the bull snatch or something like that. Mm. There's definitely something along those lines. I absolutely adore how massively jacked he is that he can't even grab onto the bear without bending his back. This was the gym where Natty Ilya yes. did that 215 squat yeah. jack. Yeah. Was that on his break or was that on his comeback? No, Does that was on his break, I think. I would think it was, that on, was a break. on a little it was all kind fun. Of holiday time. Yeah. Was it all fun and games? Was that 215? Or was that, when was that 215? It was in this gym for sure. I recognize this, the platform yeah. and and uh, the stairs. But in terms of silly snatching, this is an outrageous, a deficit 170 snatch. Oh, yeah. Like if you think about how little people have snatched 170. So there's this quote going around from Joe Rogan on Instagram where it's like, the percentage of people who can squat 405 and all the boys are putting up their 180 squats. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, and then you have someone yeah. like Vasily power snatching 170 from deficit. And then you're like, how few people... Could even snatch 170 alone ever of of the world. Probably fit them all in this room. Probably maybe a few people. Maybe this floor. Yeah, the floor of this building. It's absolutely and to do it like this. Yeah, insane. How fast and snappy and from deficit. You you could probably fit everyone who could power snatch 170 into this room. Yes, the studio. We're not going to tell you quickly. Ring Clarence. (laughs) Next up, we've got Monica Marash from Poland, and she snatched 103 in competition. Yeah, I always feel like her lifting is absolutely textbook. Textbook. I feel like this is what, when you do your EWF international coaching course or you do your BWL course or whatever it is, this is what is shown to you at every stage along the way. Her technique has always looked like this. It always looks super consistent. Even when we see her lifting weights that are near to failure, sometimes in the catch position it gets a bit shaky, but her pull is always perfect. Her extension is always very, very good. And it is just textbook, to be fair to her. That's the level of upper back and lower back extension Anton wants me to have, but I (laughs) do not have. But I'm working hard to get it. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the upper back extension of a 70-odd kilo girl, but I... I would like it. I would like it for my you lifting. You should ask for it for Christmas. I don't think you can get it, unfortunately, <laughs> unless I lose 50 kilos. It's out of stock. But Monica has, you know, super technique, really consistent, very culturally Polish technique, like we were talking about there, when you can kind of see that style of technique. They have a big history of weightlifting, a lot of institutional knowledge, loads of amazing looking gyms. And, you know, it really comes through when they're lifters and they've always seemed to support their lifters quite well. And Monica is one of the the stars of the the female side. Now, speaking of superstars, the uh, star of American weightlifting currently, or one of two major stars, Hampton Morrison, of course, Livy Reeves. So Hampton is here with 201 for a set of 10 on the back squat. Yeah, and his back squat technique always interests me. So firstly, I think this is a very, very effective back squat for weightlifters to use. 
I would very much put this in the category of a back squat that's working heavily on developing leg strength and not necessarily working on this for the sake of developing better squat patterns. So you see here, he's very much toes forward. He doesn't have a crazy wide stance, but it's probably somewhere outside hip width, not quite as wide as shoulder width. And this is, if we were to look at a more extreme version of this, this is what we see from squats like Lee Sang Yang. So not a massive amount of forward knee travel, a very much quad dominant squat, but it's not a squat where we're kind of forcing the toes out to the side or really rooting out a kind of very deep bottom position, but very much focusing on the most amount of tension through the quads as possible and very, very effective at training the legs. So... While we could talk about the technique as well, I do want to talk about the technique of the spotter who didn't touch the fucking bar, oh, which yeah. was just great. It's like, yeah. ET, on the last rep, like, what do you know if you have an elite level athlete like this and you know your athlete? I don't even know if this is coaches, but when you know the person you're spotting, like, Hampton isn't going to hurt themselves failing a set of squats, but he just needs a little bit of extra assistance in the right place if he needs the assistance. And so, just not touching the barbell. Yeah. And then on the last rep, you can see his hands just coming close to it, but not touching it. This is this is the level of spotting. This is what we want. This is what this we want. This is what we want to see on the new show. Yeah. Now, sticking with Hampton, we have 180 kilo clean on jerk. So, this is from before, I assume, the World Cup in Thailand. So, you said Throwback Thursday, TBT. And he said ready to build to this 180 is four kilos over his senior world record at 176. And this looks great. Looks insanely strong. I remember seeing his world record and being shocked at how good it looked. Mm. This looks even more solid, even more kind of consistent. Very, very sharp lifting here. So name did something like 190 as a 60 kilo lifter, just to put that in perspective. Just to... Jesus. Put that in yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I really like that colorway of the tears, the red and the red and black. Really? Yeah, I do. I do like the the blood red. You know, you have a grow for weightlifting shoes on like ev anyone I've ever known. On. I think everyone knows that. <laughs> so Hampton putting up some big lifts. A bit of a deficit to go in the snatch. I think everyone knows that. You know, Leafa Ben, who's probably going to go snatch one forty six. Hampton did one twenty seven. So. I think silver is pretty locked in, and it would be fantastic for Hampton, of yeah. course. Maybe even another senior world record, but it would be we'd be hoping for a bad day from Leif Bin to get the gold. I think, and I assume Leif Bin is going to be coming out aggressive, hot. Yeah. It also it it's worth saying the level of inconsistency in weightlifting, and you just never know what's going to happen on you the day. You just never know. You never know. You just got to show up and do your job, and then see what happens with everyone else. Obviously, there's a bit of kind of gamifying it change the weights around picking the right attempts but a lot of medals are won in weightlifting from you showing up and doing the right things and other people showing up and messing up their job now here we've got 1000 tiger <laughs> oh wait 10,000 tiger sorry 10,000 tiger we don't know his body weight but i'm assuming he's double digits body weight so that's why he has to be so it's 340 kilo conventional deadlift in a commercial gym. And sometimes, and we're guilty of this on the new show, just, just putting in the biggest lifts from the biggest people. But you forget that these lifts, well, itself 340 is a massive deadlift anyway, but 340 at a, a not a triple digit body weight is yes. incredibly impressive, you know. So this is super tidy as well and conventional. He is, so the deadlift form, if you look at the other deadlifts on his, on his profile, tends to lift up very high hips, tends to be very much towards a stiff-legged deadlift than it is towards a kind of conventional powerlifting deadlift form. And he has some kind of full backgrounding going on there. Doesn't seem to be holding him back in any way. Uh, and he actually doesn't maintain that level of flexion in his lockout. He actually goes to full extension, which is the opposite of what you'd see some of the strong men or some of the powerlifters doing, where they have quite a bit of upper back rounding and they hold on to that rounding all the way through, even into extension. Um, I think, as Owen was saying, sometimes we do lose sight of just how incredibly heavy 340 kilos is. Yeah. We're used to hearing about the 500 kilo plus deadlifts. We're used to seeing people doing 400 for reps. And sometimes when you see the three as the first number of the deadlift, you make the insane thought that, oh, that's not incredibly impressive. This is absolute lunacy. And this is impossible for most people who will ever lift weights in their entire life. You'll never get close to 340. It's an unbelievable deadlift. Blaze 340. <laughs> now, sticking with those bodyweight deadlifts, we have 
The world record in the under 82 kilo for strongman is 300 kilos by Summer Johnson. Now, the funny thing about this video is that he's bleeding and he's like, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, it's, it's a great deadlift. What is very notable about this is that obviously in strongman, a lot of the places will let you hitch, but he's just a super clean deadlift and very, very nice, very nice positions, very smooth pull through that first and second pull. Uh, some people don't like when you use first, second pull with deadlifting, but... Eric, get over it. It's it's correct. Like <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Uh, an interesting point on hitching, and an interesting point on hitching at lighter body weights. At lighter body weights, the hitch tends to be less effective. So there's not enough mass there. or It's not that there's not enough. There's not as much mass there. When we see the massive strongmen hitching deadlifts and really bumping that deadlift weight around it has less of an influence on them than 300 kilos will have to an 80 kilo lifter so obviously you're dealing with that body mass versus the mass of the barbell and then their total combined mass so that's why we tend to see less of that super aggressive hitching for those lighter weight classes i haven't seen a forehead explode before i can't think i have seen I think we see a lot of foreheads explode in squats because people tend to bang their head off the bar before they do it. Definitely nosebleeds on deadlifts. Mm -hmm. Some ear and eye bleeds sometimes. A lot of ass bleeding. Uh, very personal level of bleeding there. But in terms of a forehead bleed on a deadlift, this might be a new one for me. I don't know. Maybe I'm sure it must I have seen like it. have seen Larry Wheel's deadlift... Uh, uh, bleeding from his forehead before the west side lads used to bleed all the time didn't they, they used to bleed a lot yeah the lead fds i think it's probably a blood pressure issue yes now sticking with strongman deadlifts we've got instagram handle is called super ed seven and luton's most strongest put up this video so it's a 383 kilo deadlift and it's under 90 kilo body weight so the under 90 is a weight class in strongman sometimes and it's definitely getting a lot more love the un the smaller weight classes in strongmen, smaller not being 180 kilos, <laughs> uh, but this 383. So we just saw 300 at under 82. So this 383 at under 90. Yeah, the, the so this is a great deadlift, 100 percent hands down. But a noteworthy thing for you if you're watching this video is look at his lever lengths and look at how well built he is for deadlifting. When he locks out that deadlift, so really good form, really nice tempo throughout the lift, a good aggressive pull, no hitching or pausing throughout. But when he locks out that bar, if he was to open his hands, his fingertips would be below the level of his knees. And that's why when we look at people, sometimes you're saying, oh, that's an amazing deadlift. It's not that they don't train incredibly hard to get there, but some people are just built better for deadlifting. And this is one of those cases in the same way where Owen is built better for squatting, this dude, Super Ed, is built phenomenally well for deadlifting. Yeah, use it if you have it. Don't be Absolutely. Don't be ashamed of it. <laughs> so next up, we've got Nicholas Dupree. And he was at the powerlifting series in Abs Gym in Dublin. And they seem to have turned on the lights for this level of powerlifting series, which is we're big fans of now. <laughs> we're big fans of. So they turned off the fireworks and the rave music, I think, or at least the fireworks. So everyone's much safer. Nicholas squatted 427 and a half kilos. And, you know, th there was someone making a comment before. I think it was on one of our videos talking about Nicholas hasn't really done anything in comp, you know, and that people are hyping up too much. But he might, from what looks from our side, that he keeps yeah. up the competition. And even though he didn't win this, he's still putting up those big numbers that he's doing in training are very, very close to them in competition. What I really like with Nicholas as well is you can see clear progress coming from competition to competition. Obviously, we have him on the new show quite frequently. I'll touch base with his profile every so often and keep an eye on his squats and stuff. I really like him as an athlete. He seems to be doing the right things. An absolute monster of a squat. Gareth, when are you going to start squatting low bar and go to a powerlifting competition? Never. That's I what would. we're all asking. That would be... That's what the people want to know. Psychological... Come on. Seppuku? What's the one where you kill yourself? The imaginarily that's what that would be for me <laughs> I don't know what's the one where I, I you Put have to the sword you, in your stomach and you have to cut off my head at the same time Sudoku oh, I think Sudoku yeah yeah that's the one now who did win the competition was Dave Richardson and Aries he's winning deadlift at 432 and a half kilos so this is to win the pro clash of titans 2 and we were wondering about how much money they got, but we didn't actually, didn't see anywhere. If anyone does know, please comment it down below, because I'd love to know 
out of pure morbid curiosity. They they keep getting back the big lifters. So they're obviously doing something right in terms yeah. of like facilitating the competitions. You don't hear of anything going wrong. You don't hear of any problems. There's no drama with the judges or anything like that. It seems to all go quite without hitch, and, and no one gets burned by fireworks, even though. It, Look at how many lights are on there, Owen. So many this lights. This seems on. lovely. We should have gone and watched this. Nah, it's too far away. <laughs> so 432 and a half kilos for Dave Richardson. He is, we've had him on the new show before, yeah. uh, absolute all-rounder. But this deadlift, I th- think this deadlift might be PB for him. I don't know if he's done 440. And this is this was for the win, for the belt. So incredible lifting. Yeah, one thing I will say that makes, one thing that kind of comes to mind when you see this, obviously, it's probably the last deadlift of the day. It's definitely the deadlift that he wins the competition on. But immediately for him to pop his belt off and then be named winner and then somebody immediately hand him the belt and then hold his hand up and then he kind of has to stand there for pictures. We've all been there with max deadlifts where it's very, very kind of overwhelming. You just need to chill out for a second and then get the belt. So someone was saying in the comments that he won it convincingly. He got the weight selections perfect all the way. So nice. if Nick or Dan, I assume Dan Bell, had picked the weights differently, it could have been a different story, but that's all part of the game. So that is interesting. In weightlifting, we mostly care about the individual lifts. And there's certain landmark totals, like a 300 kilo total, and then the next one's like a 400 kilo total. You know, that's kind of about yeah. it. But in powerlifting, it really does come down to the total in competition. I know it does in weightlifting too, but it really... But you've only got two lifts, and one of them is a lift that you can lift a little bit more. And if you're there, the whereabouts for one, and you've got a bigger clean and jerk, it's kind of like you, you know who's going to win more or less. Mm. There's going to be placing, but when it comes to part of thing, because you've such a long day, you've got an extra lift in. You know the lifts are heavy; they're very, very fatiguing, and there's a lot that can change in terms of attempts. And sometimes you need to take a big attempt. Sometimes you need to be really conservative. You do have to be paying attention to what those other lifters are doing. So it does come down to ultimately. You know, if you're someone like John Hack, where you're running away with it, but yeah, if you're yeah. in this super competitive position here, where there's a couple of guys who could all win, it does come down to the selection, the, the attempts you're making, and do you save it for later in the day, or do you blow your load on your squats currently? Like, there, there's a lot of thought to it. I love to see the fact that the abs powerlifting, the kind of pro series, is getting so big. Mm. It's great to see. It's great to see competitions like that really putting it up and really kind of bringing it every single time, getting the big athletes putting up the prize money is class and I love to see it in Ireland as well so here we've got Jan Juris or Juris he has been on the new show a few times before and he put up this 310 kilos for a set of 12 so we're only just talking about how impressive you know 300 plus kilo deadlifts are for a lot of people and then Jan is just doing Jane is just doing this uh, Jan is Jan we Jan is uh, just doing this 310 kilos for a set of 12 we have a kind of spot or a, a ribbon we give to each video each week called their weekly delve into lunacy. And this is definitely the weekly delve into lunacy. How easy all of these reps look, rep one through rep 12, just makes absolutely no sense in my brain. Mm. If someone, if a normal standard mortal human being was doing this with 200 kilos, I'd be like, yeah, that's incredibly impressive to do that with 200. To do it with 310 kilos is just absurd. Here we've got Frank Allen. So Frank has made an appearance in the last few new shows. He's someone we wasn't really on our radar, but he squatted 425 kilos. He said he came to the gym early enough to hopefully there be some spotters, but there was last no one there. So this 425 kilos is a all-time PR. He said, even though today is not the strongest my squats have been, and he's got six weeks to clean up, so obviously for a competition. So 425 is very nice and moving very, very well. Always very confident with depth. Is I never a doubt looking at the squats. You know, sometimes you see part of in training, but walking it out and absolutely nailing it and then walking it back in is uh, no mean feat in of itself. No, what I love as well is the confidence of going down with speed into that bottom position. You know, like he's really getting as much as he possibly can out of that shed shortening cycle in the bottom. He maintains his positions incredibly well as well, considering the speed and how much force is being put in at the bottom of that squat. I love it. It's definitely one of my favorite low bar squatters at the moment in terms of absolute weight, but also in terms of kind of pizzazz uh, being brought into that squat. Oh, he's going to the Abs Reach Rumble in September. Oi, oi. Uh, but obviously there's something else sooner, a USAPL lift. So I wonder, did he walk it out so far because he's no spotters in case he missed it forward and he didn't absolutely guillotine himself? 
might be why because he walked it pretty yeah, far. Yeah, he walked it very far. That's a lot of thought to be doing if that was the reason while squatting four hundred twenty five kilos yeah. for an all time PB, avoiding absolute death. <laughs> now here we have got a thrower, and he is doing a power clean Korean pull is what they call a made of thing where you're almost kind of turning it over, but you don't actually rack it into a hang power clean at two hundred kilos. It's Christian Ke. And he is six foot nine, and this is ridiculous. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. It is so good. The the panda pull itself, when you see it at the start, you're like, oh yeah, that's kind of insane. Throwers do that. Most throwers don't do it with two hundred kilos. But to see how easy the power clean is makes no sense. So he's racking the barbell on his chest. He has a front rack position. The barbell's touching his shoulders. He's jumping just outside shoulder width, which isn't a problem. He's in a great position. He doesn't have any major knee valgus going no. on. The timing in the barbell is perfect. He's even got that vibration into the barbell where you see a very good athlete when they power clean a good weight that they time it so well that the oscillation just keeps happening because they're putting so much force into it. And he is six foot nine doing this at 200 kilos. If that's not useful for your, for your throwing, I don't know what is. Yeah, I absolutely love to see it. I think a lot of the time uh, weightlifting athletes or people who do weightlifting as part of their sport will use something like the Korean pull or the panda pull and they will have it in their head that I'm pulling it this high. If I wanted to, I could just turn the bar over and catch it. And this is what most people have in their head as to I can do this if I want to because I'm able to do the first movement. It therefore means I'm able to do the second movement. Most people aren't able to do the second movement this well and this efficiently, though. Most of the time, it just does not look like this. Also, I love to see the tall guys getting after it in the weight room. Far too often we hear, particularly for people's squats, them saying, oh, I'm not able to lift well or my technique has to be this way because I'm so tall or because my arms are so long or my legs are so long. Uh, this guy is six foot nine and Christian definitely doesn't seem to be holding himself back in that respect. It was the subgroup tall guys with glasses too. Was that yeah. a thing? Yeah. Do you feel a kindred spirit? Yes. Now, next up, we've got Boss Rutan, the former first UFC heavyweight champion. He used to be fighting Pancreas and was it one championship as well? In and he was in Pride for a while. Pride, that well. was a Pride in yeah. Pancreas. Uh, very famous for knocking people out with his palm. <laughs> Bass is I, late 50s now, I think. Certainly, I think he's in his 50s. And Bass was always in fantastic shape. Bass Rutan. And he was always in great shape. Such an entertaining fellow to listen to. Very motivational if you listen to him. He had a nerve issue with his neck and used to call his smaller arm his like mini me was that what he called the yeah, arm something like that yeah now he was always in great shape when he was in fighting shape the last few years obviously when he's in his late 40s and 50s he's not going to be in as good a shape he's not keeping up but he put up these photos the other day just yesterday with with george st pierre gsp and he looks fucking unbelievable My holy shit god he's in insane shape this one here yeah. I assume he just got hired into that TRT bandwagon. We can only hope. We can only hope. I remember him talking about getting the IV stem cells make you feel like there was lightning in his veins. Yes. So hopefully he's getting something else that's helping him out here. The big kind of major thing here is how much of that dystrophy in his arm seems to be gone away. Yes. Uh, really noteworthy. I think he's in with karate combat at the moment. I saw him doing some... Uh, He's a, he's been involved for a long time. I think it's is one he, of I think he's one of the founders. I think I saw him entering in Craig Jones's details in a vlog a few weeks ago, and he looked insane in that vlog as well. But he is in some shape. Bas Rudin was obviously super intense, very kind of a crazy fighter. But it turns out that testosterone does cure everything. Apparently, <laughs> you know, if you have a nerve damage, just possibly take testosterone. He's in outrageous shape. Uh, it takes someone to be in very very good shape to kind of overshadow GSP's athleticism in a photo. Yes. And GSP looks like kind of a teenager here. Yeah, GSP's... <laughs> I think he's just 40 or a little bit older and he's obviously in very good shape and he still trains very active and he's very diligent with his diet and you can see that from his Instagram, but... He ain't bass rooting though. He has not bass rooting. So, sticking with the fighters, there's Mikey Musumeci or Dark Rigatoni. He is a... Currently at the moment, specifically like a no-gi jiu-jitsu athlete, and he's very famous for only eating pizza. He lives in, 
Hong Kong or Singapore? Singapore. Uh, professional jiu-jitsu fighter. And he's multiple world championships in the gi. And he is fighting for one at the moment, one championship. He does a lot of their, their grappling fights. And he's always been very, very lean and in great shape. But yeah. he put up this photo a week ago and... I don't think he's ever been in this kind of shape before. This is crazy. Yeah, it's funny. Like, there's obviously lighting has a massive impact on this. He's probably after doing three hours of sparring just before this. But Mikey's always this lean. Mm. And then sometimes you just see this kind of freakish uh, representation of just how lean he is. One thing I do like about Mikey is when he talks about that diet protocol and when he talks about the fasting and stuff like that, he always says, oh, yeah, it works great for me, but nobody else should be doing it. Or it works great for me, but I know this isn't the best thing possible for other people to be doing, which I think is valuable. A lot of the time we see athletes doing really weird exclusion diets or really weird stuff, and their immediate reaction is everybody else should be doing this. Uh, so Rogan goes carnivore, everybody else should be carnivore. I feel great when I'm carnivore. You'd feel great when you're a carnivore. Uh, definitely most athletes fall into that trap. Uh, so I'm glad to see Mikey doesn't fall into it too. Yeah, so he said he fasts all day, doesn't eat before training, trains for probably five, six, seven hours a day, and then has, well, he said it was something like 7,000 calories in the evening, which I don't think is the case, but certainly a very large meal. I don't know if this is what he does all the time. That's the way it's, it seemed in those interviews and the videos he's making, where it's, that's what he did in the evening. We just ate a load of pasta and homemade pizza and around a litre of olive oil yeah <laughs> it's certainly very high cal very as well but he is incredible jiu-jitsu at least and yeah he's always been absolutely shredded but i think this has been maybe just as he matures more so he's mm. quite young so maybe as he matures out a little bit more he's probably gaining a bit more lean mass and for people who don't know who don't watch jiu-jitsu and you're looking at him here he's super anti PDs in sports he very vocal about it and he does some fights where he submits to drug testing when he doesn't have to or he did that in one recent fight so you know make it that way what you will um, yeah. we're not making a comment either way there but just for I know there's people watching who don't follow Jiu Jitsu and you're like oh he's obviously in gear yeah I think he's one of the major proponents of uh, tested Jiu Jitsu um, but obviously make it at what you will. Thanks very much for watching. As we said throughout this, if you'd like to try out any of our training programs, the best thing you could possibly do is download the app. So it'll give you a free trial. You can download one or two of training programs. You also get to look through the movement library and the program library. So you'll get a very, very good idea of what's to offer, what might suit you best. Also, while you're there, have a chat with the coach bot. It's been trained on the last five or six years of Seeker Strength question and answer videos and YouTube videos and all of our content. So it has the answer to most of your questions you're going to have during training. If it doesn't have the answer to one of those questions, the best thing you could do, shoot us an email, seekerstrength at gmail.com and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And as always, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for everyone who sent us in DMs of the new show. So as I say, every week, I look through every single one of those. So they all get looked at and it does make you a lot, lot better. So if you see anything that you want to see in the new show, send it in and we might be able to put it in and enhance the quality of the new show.